everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Debbie O'Kane. I am the program director for the North Fork Environmental Council. We welcome you this evening, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Vincent Breslin from the uh, Southern Connecticut State University joining us this evening, talking about microplastics in Long Island Sound. So just to um, give you a few housekeeping items to keep in mind, what we'd like to do is keep you all on mute at the moment so we don't have any uh, feedback during the presentation. Um, we can save questions until the very end. And if you do have a question, please raise your hand and Dr. Breslin would uh, be happy to um, answer any questions that you have, but let's uh, go through the presentation and uh, save those questions until the very end. Um, so this uh, presentation is actually being co-hosted by North Fork Environmental Council and my colleagues, Dawn Carol Nish and Mark Habner are joining us as well. Um, and North Fork Audubon Society and um, on the other side of the pond, Save the Sound. Um, is uh, co-hosting this presentation as well. So I think we have uh, participants from um, two different states uh, joining us this evening, which is, which is lovely. And um, North Fork Environmental Council and North Fork Audubon have been working together for quite a number of years doing um, pesticide reduction and elimination uh, education. We have a video on YouTube. Um, it's under North Fork Environmental Council, correct, Dawn? Um, if there's, there's a link there, um, actually uh, doing some um, demonstrations on products that are um, really good for eliminating and uh, replacing plastic items uh, in your home, in and around your home. Um, we also have uh, two beach cleanups scheduled for this weekend. One is in Riverhead from 11 in the morning until, I'm sorry, from nine until 11, that's at Iron Pier Beach on the Sound. And then we also have a beach cleanup in Mattituck this weekend, and that's uh, at Breakwater Beach. So, and that's also on the Sound. So you can join us there. Um, you can also, um, uh, go out and do a beach cleanup on your own. We recommend using an app called Clean Swell, which actually um, helps you to record whatever um, debris, marine debris you're actually um, cleaning up from local beaches. Uh, it helps to um, uh, keep track of data, especially all the plastics that um, are washing up on our beaches and um, this presentation will definitely um, give us a really good idea of why we need to eliminate plastics um, from Long Island Sound and other uh, surrounding waters and from our beaches. So just to um, give you a little introduction, Dr. Breslin is a professor in the Department of the Environment in uh, Geography. Uh, and Marine Sciences at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. He received his bachelor's degree in marine biology from the University of New England, his master's degree in marine environmental sciences from Stony Brook University here on Long Island, and his PhD in oceanography from the Florida Institute of Technology in Florida. Dr. Breslin is also a member of the Long Island Sound Study Science and Technical Advisory Committee. He is a co-founder and co-coordinator of the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities Worth Center for Coastal and Marine Studies. Dr. Breslin has received funding and published papers in support of laboratory and field-based studies examining the biogeochemical behavior of contaminant metals in coastal sediments and the consequences of microplastics in the marine environment. Current research is now being conducted at SCSU concerning microplastics and the potential for their incorporation in marine food webs. 
So Dr. Breslin, I'm gonna turn the program over to you because I know at this point um, you'll be elaborating on, on all of that as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, and so thank you for inviting me to uh, present to you some of the work that we're doing uh, here at, at Southern uh, with respect to microplastics uh, in the marine environment. Uh, and so during the presentation, I'm going to share with you uh, some of the origin of the problem in, in terms of why we've got a problem with plastics at this point in time. Uh, and also share a little bit of the research that we've been doing here at Southern uh, with respect to microplastics, and, and then end up uh, discussing a little bit about potentially some of the solutions to the problems that we're seeing uh, with microplastics in the marine environment. Um, to really get at why we're seeing uh, you know, more microplastics and plastics in general in the environment, it helps to go back to look at uh, the municipal solid waste generation rates over time. And so the figure I've shown here in this slide uh, shows you the uh, solid waste generation rates uh, from 1960 through 2018. And this is the uh, municipal solid waste, which is the garbage and trash that you put out in front of your house each week that's collected. And as you can see here, from 1960, we started out at about 90 uh, million tons of garbage, and we're now up to almost 300 million tons uh, generated annually in uh, the United States. And about uh, each person in the United States is generally uh, generating between four and five pounds per person uh, of municipal solid waste per day. Um, and you can see that we've done a nice job of leveling off the per capita uh, generation rate. Um, but nonetheless, the total amounts of municipal solid waste continue to increase over time. Now, if we take a look at the kinds of materials that uh, are contained in municipal solid waste, uh, I've shown you this pie chart here. And this shows the components by material. Uh, and so you see things like the yard trimmings, uh, rubber, le uh, leather, and textiles, metals, and glass. And I've left here a couple of these slices of the pie. I've covered up what the uh, percentages are. And clearly, one of the percentages is plastic. Uh, one is paper and one is food. And, and usually when I talk to my students or classes, I have them raise their hands to say which of these three slices of the pie, the blue, kind of the yellow or the green is plastics. Uh, and so let's, let's take a look at this. So the largest slice of the pie is paper. Uh, so by mass, uh, we, the greatest volume or the greatest mass of materials that we put out each week uh, is paper. Uh, and that is followed by food. Uh, we actually dispose of and, and waste quite a bit of food and that's followed up by plastics at about 12 to 13% of the municipal solid waste that we generate is plastics. <clears throat> and yet, I think a lot of people think it's, you know, a, a much, much higher percentage than that. And, and there's a couple of reasons why that may very well be. And, and one is just the nature of the plastics themselves. They, they tend to be very lightweight, flexible, durable, transparent. And there's a it, you know, the, the amount of mass per volume, uh, you know, there's a lot of the volume of plastics, but they're very lightweight. So we tend to see plastics uh, and, and especially they're a very visible contaminant when they enter the environment. Um, also important with plastic is that there's different polymers, there's different types of plastics and each of these different types of plastics uh, have different purposes. So for example, we may all be familiar with uh, plastics like polyethylene, uh, polypropylene or polyethylene terephthalate, which are the soda bottles. And each of these different polymers have different physical and chemical properties, um, which are used in various packaging strategies for, for to, to uh, contain and package different types of products. But we're going to talk about how those polymers and different physical chemical characteristics of, their pro of those polymers uh, contribute to some of the problems that we're seeing. What's also true with plastics 
is they don't readily degrade in the environment. Um, you know, plastics are an ideal packaging material because they are very durable, they're transparent, you can print on them, um, they, they serve that purpose quite well. But oftentimes their actual useful lifetime in packaging can be very short, especially in terms of their overall lifetime in the environment. Uh, plastics do not readily degrade. When they become part of litter, um, usually uh, photo degradation over time will cause them to begin to break down and fragment. Uh, but plastics typically are not readily biodegradable. Um, and, and that creates some problems when they get out into the environment as well. And it's because of the fact that we have uh, a number of different polymers that are used in plastic packaging products and that we collect those materials, those different types of products, and, and try to recycle those, that it creates quite a challenge for solid waste disposal technologies uh, and the existing infrastructure for doing that. Uh, usually we collect commingled plastic, uh, many different types, we bring them to material recovery facilities where they're separated into various commodities. Um, but there are issues and there are some problems that, with that, that that we'll cover tonight in the presentation. Of course, you know, we're very familiar with scenes like this where you have plastic that uh, ends up on our beaches. And of course, uh, many of you will probably be participating in coastal cleanups uh, this coming weekend or next weekend. Uh, to remove some of this kind of debris and, and you see lots of consumer items in here the forks, the bottle caps, and these are very typical of the types of debris that we find washed up on our beaches in the grasses and in the rack lines of uh, our beaches here in Long Island Sound. Um, and that creates very much an aesthetic problem. And, you know, the aesthetics is bad enough, but, you know, oftentimes people coming to a beach, if, if they see plastics, you know, in, in the uh, grass areas on the beaches themselves. They also interpret that as having some impact on water quality. Uh, and it may necessarily may not be the case, uh, but certainly if people uh, see plastics and they see this kind of debris on the beach, there are economic consequences to that as well. And that uh, people certainly don't want to swim in the water. And if it's a persistent problem, uh, they'll vacation elsewhere or go to different beaches elsewhere. We're also pretty familiar with the wildlife impacts of you know, uh, plastic debris that makes its way on the beaches. I actually took this picture of a, um, you know, a gull that was uh, trapped in a plastic grocery sack on a beach in Rhode Island. And we know that wildlife can be uh, you know, entangled in this plastic debris. Uh, we also know that turtles, birds, and other animals can ingest plastic pieces uh, and research is showing that, uh, you know, the gut contents of many types of birds, uh, turtles, and other marine organisms or animals, uh, the gut contents uh, contain plastic and plastic pieces. And, and that has, you know, detrimental effects on the health of these animals. And of course, with COVID over the last two years, something that we're seeing a lot more of now is uh, personal protection equipment. Uh, masks, gloves, Purell bottles, um, all sorts of things that are ending up, you know, on our roadsides, uh, parking lots, uh, in stormwater, taking these uh, and washing them into our, um, you know, estuaries and where they end up on beaches in Long Island Sound. So we are seeing much more of this, and, and this is becoming quite a new problem that people aren't disposing of uh, their masks and gloves and so on properly. And I expect that this, this will continue as this problem persists. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk a little bit more about microplastics. And there are two different types of microplastics. Uh, there are primary microplastics, uh, and these are microplastics that are manufactured as microplastics for specific intended purposes. And then we have microplastics that we refer to as secondary microplastics. And these are uh, microplastics that are formed as a result of the deterioration of macroplastics once they enter the environment. 
Perhaps the most familiar microplastics uh, are the microbeads. And these microbeads uh, are, were manufactured specifically a number of years ago uh, as an ingredient in consumer cosmetic products. And, and they serve, they role as an exfoliant in a lot of facial cleansers and hand cleansers. And you can see on the uh, left-hand side here that uh, this is a picture of some of the microbeads that we extracted from uh, some of those products. And these are generally on the range of 10 to about a millimeter, uh, 10 microns to about a millimeter in diameter. And if you have these products, uh, usually you could tell if, the, if there's plastic microbeads because the ingredients uh, generally tell you that there are polyethylene or polypropylene uh, microbeads in the product. Now, many of these products have since been banned. Uh, you know, Connecticut was very proactive in, in banning uh, the microbeads. And that was followed very closely with a federal ban on these products. Uh, and so it was more recently, 2018, 19, that uh, these bans finally became into effect. And, uh, and so we're now seeing an elimination of these from, uh, you know, from uh, grocery stores and uh, cosmetic stores and so on. But people still have an inventory of these products in their homes. And, and so we still see, uh, you know, the presence of these microbeads in the environment uh, for a while. Uh, another uh, source of microplastics is um, the secondary microplastics and, and something that we're really seeing a lot more of nowadays, uh, and especially in some of the studies that we're doing, are microfibers. And much of our uh, clothing nowadays, and an increasing amount of our clothing, is now manufactured using fibers like polyester, nylon, polypropylene fibers. And this is some examples of that, fleece, jackets, and so on. Uh, and as you wear these clothes, uh, you walk around literally shedding fibers as the fibers wear and they begin to deteriorate. And of course, when, uh, when you do your laundry and these clothing items are in a, in a washing machine and they're being agitated, uh, that also begins to fragment some of these fibers. And you end up with what looks like this, um, you know, uh, microfibers, these, these fibers that break off and break away from these materials. And, and um, you know, again, the wearing of the clothing, the laundering of the clothing are, are known to be so, uh, sources of these fibers uh, in samples that we're now seeing uh, in the environment. So to look at how much plastic is now ending up in our clothing and the uses of plastics, uh, I'm gonna call your attention to two uh, specific pieces of this, this figure, which shows uh, primary plastics production. And this is millions of metric tons uh, from you know, when they first started manufacturing products using plastics in the 1950s uh, up till recent years. Uh, you could see almost this exponential growth of, of the use of plastics, uh, but two major uh, pieces of the pie here, the textiles and packaging are, you know, two of the major uses of plastics. And these segments of plastics manufacture are growing at a, a faster rate. Uh, you know, a lot of plastic fiber is now uh, replacing cotton and wool clothing. And uh, certainly packaging and the use of plastic packaging is, is continuing to grow uh, over time. And of course, plastic packaging, uh, these may be you know, uh, short-term uses of plastic products. And, and so once we use it, we dispose of it. And, and so how we dispose of it and how this gets uh, either recycled or, or um, de destroyed in combustion products uh, you know, through waste to energy, uh, it matters in terms of uh, keeping these materials out of uh, marine environments. So how does plastic enter uh, the ocean in areas like Long Island Sound? Well, you know, this figure from uh, Clean Coasts uh, shows a number of different sources. And of course, uh, the way we use plastics in our home uh, through these consumer cosmetic products or flushing things down our toilets uh, sends uh, plastics and microfibers from laundry machines to 
uh, waste to or um, wastewater treatment plants, municipal wastewater treatment plants. And it's interesting because municipal wastewater treatment plants aren't specifically designed to remove these materials from uh, wastewater. And some of the materials that get there do bypass these treatment systems and get discharged in treated wastewater from those facilities. And other sources include fishing gear and discarded fishing gear, um, people visiting the beaches and littering and leaving plastics behind, uh, storm drains. You know, a lot of our East Coast cities have combined sewer outfalls and uh, plastics that litter the streets in storm water can be introduced directly into rivers and streams that lead on down to uh, Long Island Sound. So we have multiple sources. Uh, one interesting paper was published uh, 2015 when we first became, um, you know, uh, aware of the microbead problem. And they tried to come up with some estimates of how many microbeads actually make it into our coastal waters from the use of these consumer cosmetic products. And they estimated that 800 trillion microbeads were being uh, washed down the drains of American households every single day. And it turns out that wastewater treatment plants can remove about you know, 95 to 99% of these plastics but that still results in about 8 trillion of these microbeads being released to waterways. And of course, when they escape into the water, they can be ingested by marine organisms and have other uh, impacts in our waterways. And even if some of this gets trapped in our biosolids at these wastewater treatment plants, many areas actually land apply biosolids, which once again puts them back in the watershed where stormwater, soil erosion can put them right back into rivers and streams, uh, which lead back to the ocean. So it really pointed to, um, you know, what seemed to be a very small problem in terms of uh, product, one product, consumer cosmetic products, um, their popular use and, and uh, really resulted in uh, tremendous quantities of these materials getting introduced to our coastal waters. You're all probably also familiar with, you know, the North Pacific garbage patch. And, and you know, this is often pointed to as a, as a real area of the world where we find tremendous uh, volume of plastics uh, that get entrained into this area. And, and, and that is true. Uh, but what I'd also like to point out here is that when you look at this issue globally, uh, there's not just the North Pacific garbage patch, there's global garbage patches in, in virtually every ocean basin where you have gyres that form because of uh, surface current circulation. Uh, and plastics come out of the rivers and streams in, in many of these areas uh, from the continents and simply get entrained into these gyres and continue to circulate. Uh, and, you know, removal, uh, you know, short of them further degrading or biofouling and sinking, uh, they tend to stay there in the, in the surface waters. Uh, and so, you know, we're slowly over time uh, accumulating plastics as, as they leave the continents uh, and because plastics are being poorly managed in areas uh, and making their way out into these oceans. So uh, we, ex we expect to see this continue uh, into the future. Why is ocean plastic a problem? Well, there's been a number of recent papers that have talked about this, and, and one of them that was, I thought, pretty interesting was this concept of the global plastic toxicity debt. And what you're looking at here is, uh, you know, a, a typical plastic product, which is the coffee mug top, uh, manufactured either using polypropylene or polystyrene. And one of the things that's very important when we think about plastics is plastics are not simply the polymer alone. Whenever you manufacture plastics, uh, you also use various additives uh, in the plastics uh, to make, to impart in those plastics certain physical properties. Uh, and these plastics contain uh, still unreacted monomer to make the polymer itself but also additives like phthalates and catalysts, plasticizers, flame retardants, 
biocides, and so on. Uh, and some of these can be um, you know, endo endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, some of them uh, can be quite toxic to organisms. As the plastic physically deteriorates and begins to fragment apart, what this uh, paper here is contending is that, you know, over time, uh, in the future, moving forward, as these plastics begin to degrade, as more surface area becomes available from the fragmenting plastics, ever increasing amounts of these additives are going to be released to the water. And so, um, and that is that future peak that we see. And those additives can have physiological and behavioral uh, consequences to organisms, including you know, uh, reproductive issues in some of these organisms that encounter these chemicals. So we can expect that this is going to be a problem for decades to come because of this slow fragmentation and release and leaching of chemicals from these plastics, from these additives. Um, so it points to this being, being a very long-term problem. And this figure shows another, um, uh, this, this same kind of concept in a, in a slightly different way, in that plastics in different polymers have this ability to both adsorb chemicals onto the surface of the plastic as well as release chemical additives to the water. Uh, and so it can act in as both a source and a sink for chemical contaminants in the marine environment. And so looking at uh, you know, high molecular weight hydrocarbons, pesticides like DDT, polychlorinated biphenyls, PAHs, combustion byproducts, uh, can get adsorbed onto the surface of these pro uh, polymers and fragments and microplastics. And of course, animals that then ingest those microplastics, there's the potential that those chemicals can get transferred to the tissues of the organisms that ingest them. Uh, and so the polymers and the plastics themselves could be a vector for uh, transferring and accumulating contaminants uh, to other organisms as, as they're in the sea surface areas. And we're also nowadays finding microplastics and studies are showing that they're virtually everywhere in the water column. Uh, you know, many plastics are buoyant and they will float at the surface of the water. Uh, and of course, birds will mistake this as food and, and ingest uh, many of these types of plastics. But they can also become biofouled and they can also sink, depending on the density and the additives and the polymers, uh, to the ocean sediments as well. Uh, and they encounter areas there. And you know, what's interesting is, is researchers are looking at you know, a wide variety of uh, marine organisms and, and finding these microplastics in, you know, in birds, in fish, in benthic organisms, uh, virtually throughout uh, the marine ecosystems. So how do we study ocean plastic? Uh, you know, uh, my students and I got interested in this really around uh, 2015, 2016, when uh, the Connecticut State Legislature really got in, interested in uh, proposing a ban uh, for microbeads that were present in consumer cosmetic products. And in the language in the bill, one of the things they said was that there was a a very high likelihood that these beads were now present in Long Island Sound. And so to protect Long Island Sound, we need to ban them. And I did some you know, quick looking around and, and, and quickly found out that really nobody had looked for these in Long Island Sound. And, and so that if we could find these, that it would really add uh, to that justification for the ban by their very presence in Long Island Sound. And so we did go out and uh, using plankton nets, uh, conducted some plankton tows in areas in New Haven Harbor and actually out in Mystic as well uh, to see if we could identify or find some of these microbeads uh, in New Haven Harbor in Long Island Sound. Uh, and what you're looking at here is um, uh, at one of the beads that we isolated from a product, a consumer cosmetic product. This was a Biore pore unclogging scrub. And I don't mean to pick on them, but that's just where we took it out of. Uh, and 
what we're really interested in is the sizes of these beads, the, the color, the, the shapes, and so on, to see if we could see similar types of beads in Long Island Sound. And, and this, is the, this is one of many beads that we found in New Haven Harbor. Um, but you know, it's, it's pretty much, it's exactly the same thing. And, and through using uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy, we were able to identify that as uh, polyethylene bead uh, as well. And so the shapes, the sizes are consistent with the beads that are used in those consumer cosmetic products. And we can't say, that that bead that we found in New Haven Harbor came from that specific product because many manufacturers of different products use these color beads um, interchangeably. Uh, but they did like these color beads. And in fact, uh, the beads and the colors actually was used in the marketing of these products. They, they kind of, uh, the consumer appeal of the different color beads in these things uh, uh, was, was part of, part of their marketing. And we, would, we found red, orange, uh, clear, uh, opaque beads, all, all sorts of different types of beads. But we were able to document their presence uh, uh, in Long Island Sound. Uh, one of the things we've also done, <clears throat> because we knew that uh, wastewater treatment plants are a significant source of um, microplastics to rivers and streams that make their way into Long Island Sound. Uh, we received funding from the Quinnipiac River Fund to take a look at treated wastewater effluent from two wastewater treatment facilities here in Connecticut that discharge into the Quinnipiac River, uh, one in North Haven and one in Meriden. And essentially, one of the things we were looking at, uh, we were interested in was specifically microfibers and looking at the concentration of microfibers in the effluent. Um, but also looking at seasonal changes in concentrations in micro, uh, microfibers to see, you know, the working hypothesis uh, being that you might expect, uh, you know, higher fiber counts in colder weather uh, because people are wearing more fleece than you would in summer uh, months, warmer weather. And we we're also looking to see if we could find microbeads because this study was done in 2019, 2020. And um, after the ban had gone into effect, and we were interested in seeing, you know, if we could see the presence or uh, the absence of these beads in the effluent would tell us a lot about uh, the effectiveness of the ban. Um, and in fact, we did find, you know, a couple of uh, microbeads, but very, very few microbeads uh, were found in our studies, you know, doing uh, repetitive sampling uh, over uh, you know a 12 month period of time seasonally. Uh, more commonly, we found what you see on the right hand side here from the Meriden wastewater treatment plant, which are fragments of plastic as well as uh, the fibers uh, and actually kind of high concentrations of fibers that we found. All sorts of colors: greens, red, blues, orange, black. Uh, you know that might be uh, you might expect to find in in clothing. And one of the things we did was uh, we did uh, wastewater treatment plant effluent studies and we calculated from the volumes that we sampled uh, concentrations of microplastics uh, on the y axis versus, uh, you know, monthly temperature. So going from, um, you know, cold weather in the winter spring to uh, warm weather in the summer. And in fact, uh, we did find uh, you know, differences in the amounts and quantities of fibers in the wastewater effluent uh, seasonally. Uh, again, in, in perhaps uh, some of that may be coming from the fact that uh, we do tend to wear more fleece in the wintertime than we do in the summertime, and that tends to be a, a major source of uh, these fibers. Uh, we also uh, did some kind of calculations looking at uh, concentrations uh, that may be entering the Quinnipiac River from the discharge of the five wastewater treatment plants uh, discharging into the Quinnipiac River on an annual basis. And, you know, some of these back of the envelope calculations, assuming similar concentrations in these effluents, it's about 280 million microplastics discharged from these five wastewater treatment plants annually uh, to 
the Quinnipiac River alone. Now you can kind of think about um, the number of wastewater treatment plants that we have in the state and the size of some of these larger plants and, and think about even though these facilities remove, and studies have shown, uh, remove you know, 95 to 99% of microplastics that go in uh, to these plants, just the massive volumes of wastewater that are treated annually, these small quantities add up to very big numbers. Uh, we're also able to, um, you know, with, with um, infrared spectroscopy, uh, identify specific polymer types in, in some of the samples that we're analyzing. And, you know, for example, this spectra that you see uh, on the top here, uh, we scan over a broad range of wavelengths. And each peak that you see here in this uh, 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 slide, uh, corresponds to a functional group that is characteristic of the chemical structure of the polymer. And so this is actually a scan of a fleece jacket, and each of these peaks is characteristic of fleece. And the fiber that you see that we took out of the wastewater, uh, when we scanned that, uh, you can see that the peaks very closely match. Uh, and so this type of technology can allow us to identify the types of polymers that we're finding in our samples, um, which uh, really helps us confirm, one, the identification of different types of polymers, but also make confirmation on the fact that what we're identifying as plastics are, in fact, plastics. Uh, we've also done some work with looking at microplastics in some marine species. And, um, you know, so, over the years, people are doing this more and more. And what you see here are some studies that have been done on uh, blue mussels, on oysters, uh, crabs. Uh, one of my students did, a, did some work with uh, menhaden uh, because menhaden uh, you know, swim through the water and feed on plankton uh, high in the water columns. So we thought that uh, the ingestion of microplastics uh, would be highly likely by these fish as they swim around Long Island Sound. Uh, and we did an analysis of the gills and the digestive system uh, of these fish for microplastics. And we were finding them, uh, microfibers in particular, uh, around three microplastics per fish uh, and fibers, uh, a length of about 1.8 millimeters. Now, the, the lengths of the fibers are important, uh, and we always measure those because there's actually studies that have been done that look at the lengths of fibers that originate in laundered fleece clothing. And that's the water that goes to wastewater treatment plants. And the sizes that we are seeing in some of these animals are consistent with the sizes that are produced uh, from your washing machine laundering clothing like this. So it does kind of, in, in a sense, help us tie us back to uh, potential sources of uh, where these microfibers are, are originating. So how did we get to this point? Um, you know, to we've got this problem um, and we like to think that recycling of plastics is, is, is going some ways towards addressing the problem. And, and one of the things I've always asked my students when we talk about recycling and plastics is, you know, how many of you participate in recycling programs? And, and virtually everybody in the class will raise their hand. And what they interpret as recycling is, you know, putting a soda bottle in a recycling bin. So really what they're doing is they're separating plastics. And, and I think all of us, uh, you know, do that faithfully. But that's really not closing the loop of recycling. And, and what recycling really is, is taking those co-mingled plastics and bringing them to a recycling facility or a materials recovery facility. And the re material recovery facility then separates these plastics into uh, you know, materials, commodities, different polymers that then get bailed and get shipped, presumably uh, to a facility that will use those plastics to make new plastic materials. Uh, and then it would be our responsibility to purchase materials with recycled content in them 
or completely recycled material. And that, in a sense, closes the loop. Uh, but I think what we're seeing in reality here for the vast majority of plastics is that loop is, is broken. If we take a look at plastics recycling rates in the US in recent years, uh, what you find is that for, for all plastics and even plastics that we target for recycling, it's quite low. Uh, at best, the polyethylene terephthalate bottles, high density uh, polyethylene bottles, detergent bottles, uh, you know, around 30%. Uh, but when you get into the, you know, the bags, the, the snacks, wrappers, other kinds of plastic products, it's really quite low. Um, and, and so we have a long way to go here uh, to, to improve our recycling uh, uh, rates and the efficiencies in which different kinds of materials get recycled. Uh, I include this for a couple of reasons. This is uh, examples of uh, plastic that is bundled, uh, leaving a material recovery facility that would then presumably be shipped to be recycled. And you know, if you look at this, I think you know many of you could easily identify that there's problems with recycling this type of plastic in this manner. Um, one is that oftentimes, you know, plastics bundled in this way that are different colors, uh, that can, you know, if you're making milk jugs, for example, and you wanted to make new milk jugs, well, you can't have blues and reds and greens in with the kind of opaque milk jug plastic that you typically see, uh, because that could serve as a kind of a contaminant. And so this kind of mixing of plastics and also in there, um, you might have more than one type of plastic in that baled plastic. And that causes problems because different polymers melt at different temperatures. And so if you heat up one polymer to make a new plastic product, if there's contamination in there, that's gonna just become, a, either it's gonna burn or it's just gonna melt as a piece of plastic, which is gonna cause a flaw in the product. Uh, so this is really a challenge uh, as to where this goes and, and how we deal with it. And so Connecticut, and I'm sure this is the case on Long Island as, as, as well, that recently um, recycling markets have collapsed. And, you know, uh, in recent years, uh, you know, Bridgeport used to receive $20 per ton for recyclables. Now they pay uh, $75 a ton. Uh, so again, it's costing municipalities a lot more money now uh, to recycle. And part of this originates from the fact that China recently has refused to accept recycled materials from the United States with a half a percent or more of contamination. Let me go back. I would ask the question, is that a half a percent or more of contamination? And frequently it is. Uh, and so that's a problem. This is 2016. And in 2016, if you look at the global import and export of plastic wastes, you see that in the United States, 2016, we exported uh, almost 26, 27 million tons of plastic. That's material that was bailed, but was not recycled here in the United States. It was shipped elsewhere. And look at China. Uh, China was very much into the uh, importing of plastic waste. Uh, some of this material was clearly uh, mishandled uh, and not always uh, recycled. Uh, and so uh, our solution for much of the accumulating plastic waste that we had, and even that material that we processed, we simply shipped overseas uh, with perhaps the intention or the understanding that it was actually getting recycled there. Uh, and, in, and in fact, it, it frequently was not. Uh, plastic waste exports, you know, you can see the, the switch here from January 2017 to January 2018, where uh, Chinese imports uh, and our export of waste dropped to virtually none. And, but what did we do in response? We've started 
uh, basically sending our plastic waste to other Southeast Asian countries, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and so again, we're, we're sending our plastic still uh, abroad. Now there is what's called the Basel Convention in 2019, uh, which is an international convention to kind of um, restrict this shipping of plastic globally uh, if there is a certain percentage of contamination in that plastic. And it's, it, it's designed to essentially create incentives to uh, have domestic recycling and domestic infrastructure to handle uh, the types of waste uh, that we're producing. Uh, but the U.S. Uh, has not yet ratified this. And so we continue to ship uh, plastic uh, to elsewhere in the world at this point in time. Why is that a problem? Well, it's a number of problems associated with that, but this is a paper that was published in 2017 and it looked at river plastic emissions to the world's oceans. And if you look at this and you look at the United States here, uh, you'd say, geez, we're doing pretty well. You know, there's not a lot of plastics, you know, plastics are getting uh, released from our rivers, uh, you know, to coastal oceans, but, you know, we're doing pretty well overall. Well, the reason we're doing pretty well overall is we're shipping that material uh, to Asian countries. And you can see here that uh, virtually all of the rivers uh, in China and in Southeast Asia are releasing, you know, excess of 20,000 tons per year of plastic waste from these rivers. Uh, and, and so we wonder why do we have, uh, you know, a, a Pacific garbage patch? Well, when you look at these emission rates of plastics from rivers to the oceans, uh, you can see quite clearly why we do. Uh, and this is a problem. Uh, and so this waste, you know, needs to be handled better uh, and, and certainly processed better. So where do we go from here? Well, you know, plastic bans are always an option. And, and in fact, you know, with what we saw with the microbeads, uh, certainly the microbead ban, uh, the federal ban and Connecticut's uh, efforts along those lines uh, really had an impact. And, and it did reduce the amount of microbeads that we do see even in treated wastewater uh, from wastewater treatment plants. You know, the banning of grocery bags, that's a good thing because that, that grocery bags are, are terrible in material recovery facilities. They gum up the works, uh, they're an issue. Uh, so bans, but these bans target specific products um, and these specific products are often a very, very small percentage of the overall plastic waste problem. Um, participating in local cleanup efforts, uh, as you guys are organizing, uh, these are great efforts and they really bring attention to the problem here. Um, you know, but again, uh, it, it's, a, it's an issue that it heightens awareness, but, it, but it's not necessarily a, a solution to the problem. You know, there's a big effort nowadays for biodegradable and plant-based plastic materials or polymers. And, and these also, you know, these are very good. And, and in fact, in some cases, these work quite well, uh, but and there's a big but here. That is if we, if these polymers, these plastics and degradable plastics are collected and disposed of in a way that's compatible or amenable to them being biodegraded. If you take a biodegradable plastic and put it in a modern sanitary landfill, it does not biodegrade. If you biodegradable plastics as litter, stay as litter for quite some time until they fragment and begin to break apart. The marine environment is not a great environment to uh, you know, to accelerate the biodegradation of, uh, of these polymers. Uh, you know, these polymers need to be targeted for composting. Uh, so again, matching products with ultimate disposal uh, is really the strategy that we should be looking for, even with biodegradable plastics. I tell my students that they should be purchasing materials with recycled content or made from recycled plastics. It's by purchasing these products that we stimulate the demand in the markets for them. Uh, you know, if we, if we 
target these kinds of plastics in, in recycled content, that will only encourage manufacturers to continue to add more and more and look for markets for it. Uh, but, but it has to start with that. And also, and perhaps most importantly here, we need to redesign and rethink plastic packaging. You know, a lot of this needs to be source reduction. I'm sure many of you open up an Amazon box and you find package, your, your product is packaged within a package within a package. And is that really necessary? Uh, and how can we make certain types of plastic packaging compatible with certain types of disposal strategies? How do we manufacture certain plastics um, you know, using one polymer in, as opposed to two or three laminated polymers together uh, to facilitate recycling for them? Uh, so these are things, and I think that's going to take more cooperation from um, you know, uh, industry, working with other groups to, to think about with the waste management systems, to think about how these could be best uh, designed moving forward. You know, there are examples of these products. Uh, and, and in fact, these Adidas running shoes that are manufactured using reclaimed ocean plastic and fibers. Um, you know, these are, these are a good product and, and they're attractive. And this is something, you know, people are buying, um, but it is a niche product at this point in time. Not, and they are expensive. Um, in terms of microfibers, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, papers out now that talk about uh, laundry strategies, like, you know, launder less frequent, launder using cold water that reduces fragmentation of fibers. You can install these kinds of aftermarket products like the, the Filtrol, which takes your rinse water and puts it through a filter that would screen out microplastics, which you could then remove and dispose of in your trash. Uh, and here in Connecticut, our trash gets incinerated, so that would keep them out of landfills and, and out of our waterways. Uh, so, you know, going about different types of strategies of how to do laundry and purchasing these filters could probably go a long way to removing uh, certainly some of these from uh, our, our wastewater effluents. Um, it's a concept of extended producer responsibility, uh, which compels manufacturers to pay for the end waste of their products. And this is something we're seeing more and more of. In fact, uh, the state of Maine has been uh, implementing some of these programs that require uh, producers to pay uh, for ultimate disposal of products. Uh, and that could go a long way towards subsidizing uh, recycling infrastructure. Uh, which could then uh, perhaps make in recycling domestically much more efficient so we're not shipping so much plastic uh, overseas. Uh, again, so a greater push for domestic use of materials rather than uh, relying on foreign markets. Um, so I, I'm going to end there and, and just uh, mention, um, you know, some of our funders here, the Quinnipiac River Fund and, and the Worst Center for Coastal Marine Studies. Um, some of our students here that have, that have participated in, in some of the microplastics uh, work and, and some of the people at the Maritime Aquarium uh, and Avery Point uh, Yukon for uh, providing boat time and also uh, some of the fish samples that we used in, in some of our studies. Uh, and I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you very much. So because we're in meeting mode, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. I guess everyone's being shy. Um, I have a question about um, the clothing and the fleece. Yes. Um, should we be looking, you know, should we be buying cotton only? I mean, should you be only using um, organic materials? Well, I, certainly that's one thing you could do. 
Uh, I, I don't know that we have to go to the extent of eliminating fleece clothing because there are some advantages to, to wearing fleece in terms of the warmth and, and durability and comfort. Um, you know, I think uh, these, it, it may be that using some of these aftermarket strategies of, you know, being careful how you wash them and how you launder them. And there's still a lot of research going on to try to identify what are the magnitude of some of the sources, you know, uh, in terms of shedding them as you wear uh, the, the clothing or if it's coming primarily from washing the clothing. Um, but there are strategies you could do is if you choose to wear that type of clothing, to reduce its impact on, on the environment. So I think that's probably where I would, I would stand on it. Okay, great, thanks. Anyone, anyone have any questions? Yeah, um, Vincent, uh, can you give us your contact information? Uh, yes, um, you know, you can contact me at uh, my email. It's uh, breslinv1 at southern ct.edu. And I can give you my office phone as well. It's, it's area code 203-392-6602. Oh, thank you. Uh, I got the, the phone number, but can you repeat the email? Yes. It's uh, Breslin, B-R-E-S-L-I-N. V as in Vincent, the number one at Southern CT, Connecticut, Southern Connecticut, southernct.edu. Thank you. You're welcome. Also, if anyone needs any information, they can email the office at the NFPC too. And I think it's important to mention that we have gone ahead and uh, recorded this. So um, if someone wasn't able to join us or if you would like to view it again, uh, we will be posting on YouTube, correct, Dawn? Yes, it will be on YouTube on our channel, but it, I'll also have a link on our website as well. And I'm sure we can do that with uh, North Fork Audubon as well. Um, Dr. Breslin, you uh, covered so much information. Thank you so very much because you really gave us an awful lot to think about, um, an awful lot of, um, you gave us some, some uh, inspiring solutions as well. So, so that was um, really good. I mean, the impacts that we have worldwide um, are just, um, you know, something that we, every one of us has to keep in mind. Um, when we're uh, just in our day-to-day -day lives using um, plastic wrap or um, when we're out purchasing fast fast fashion. And, um, you know, we just need to think in, ter in terms of durability. We need to think in terms of substitutes. We need to think in terms of, um, you know, just uh, reusing things. You know, it's, it's a very simple concept, but... Um, uh, you know, getting back to basics, using the, it's showing us those timelines and starting back in the 1950s when uh, so many of us, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, were, were born or shortly thereafter, um, you know, it really does, uh, it's a, it's a wake-up call. It's, it's definitely a wake-up call. Yeah, I would agree. I think it, it really is, you know, pl plastics are here to stay and, you know, we need to be able, we need to to think about, you know, how we can make these much more uh, environmentally compatible. And, and that includes the chemicals and the additives that are used in the manufacturing of the plastics. So even if we're not making uh, less plastics, we could be making less toxic plastics. And we could change types of additives to make it such that as they decompose, they wouldn't be as much of a threat in, in different environments. So there, there are a lot of possibilities for you know, going, you know, down the road in terms of addressing the issues from not only the, the quantity and, and types of materials we're using as plastics, but also the kinds of additives that we're putting in the plastics. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I did serve as a, uh, uh, on a uh, council here, a microfiber council in the state of Connecticut uh, at a legis for the state legislature. And I can tell you that 
Um, clothing manufacturers are very attuned to this issue and they're developing uh, different types of polymer fibers that will be more robust, that will fragment less frequently. They're looking at the additives to the, to the fibers to make them less toxic or hazardous or potentially hazardous moving forward. I think you know the attention that's being brought to the issue now um, really, uh, I think, you know, because there are clothing manufacturers who are very sensitive to these issues and, and they are responding. And I, and I was very encouraged to see that in some of those meetings. Uh, Margaret Mark, has a question. Yeah, um, I know that uh, chemical additives cause, you know, uh, physiological issues, but you also put in behavioral health issues. And I was curious about that. I yeah, I, I, I have not, I don't have expertise in that. Um, but that, that has been identified as one of the outcomes. And, and I would have to look more into that um, to really get into what those specific behavioral issues may be. Uh, but I know that reproductive issues, uh, absolutely. Okay, thank you. There are other raised hands, I believe. Hi, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation, lots of uh, great information and uh, thank you for sharing. But I do wanna say that we won't be able to recycle our way out of this mess. Um, when you're talking about plastic pollution, that is not including um, all the other um, effects that happen from the extraction, from the refining and the manufacturing, from the way, you know, obviously the waste management. And even, you know, coastal cleanups are also important, but that's again, putting it on the consumer. Like, oh, the, you know, if we didn't litter, then we wouldn't have this problem. But it's really the manufacturers that have created the problem and they're blinding us to um, the fact of what they're doing. So it's, you know, yes, don't use uh, saran wrap every day or any day. <laughs> I don't think I ever bought a, any, any of it in my entire adult life, but uh, you know, I do drive 40 miles to work, so there you go. But anyway, um, that, that is an important thing is to realize that it's our problem that's being dumped on us and we aren't going to be re able to recycle, you know, out of this. It's and and it is an important plastic is important, but it should be used um, intelligently, not for just like oh, I need a cup of coffee, and throw it across, you know, out of the, out of the car window, which you know they that's what they want to make us believe is right. our fault. But thank you. Yep. Others? Hi, uh, Louise Harrison here. Hi, Louise. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm very well, Vince. How are you? Good to hear from you. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, you're looking even better. Yeah. Um, we, we're both a lot older now. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've moved to the North Fork, and um, I have a particular interest uh, because I'm living near a salt marsh that has become a sink for microplastics. And uh, I know a lot of what your presentation was was really helpful in, with regard to um, the numbers and the solutions, but I'm still interested in the impacts uh, that, and wondering, do you know of people studying um, microplastics in sediments that are accumulated uh, in salt marshes? And I'm finding that I can, I can take five square inches of, of this of the salt marsh sediment near me and spend the day picking out you know with tweezers um, microplastics and I can go down probably 12 inches and still be picking out microplastics I haven't done that but um, I bet you I, that's what it would be um, they're deep yeah. they're, they're accumulating they're coming in here they're being trapped at Goldsmith Inlet and I go a step beyond in my imagination thinking that that's going to affect um, the formation of peat 
yeah. uh, because microplastics float. <laughs> and yeah. as the tides come in and out, I could, you know, the sediment can just go up and down and keep agitating and as it will anyway, but I, I, I see some flotation perhaps being buoyed up, um, you know, with microplastics. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, do you know people are studying uh, microplastics in sediments? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, and they've done a lot of this in the Great Lakes, uh, more so I think than, than many regional estuaries that I'm aware of at this point in time. Um, and, and of course, we're considering doing some of that work ourselves. Um, you know, I, I joke that, you know, at, at some point in time in the future, uh, they're going to refer to this as kind of the plasticine and someone's going to take sediment cores and you're going to go back and say, ah, there we go, 2015 to 2020, because we're finding all these microbeads. Uh, you know, they're going to be markers in sediments uh, because they're not going to degrade in sediments. Uh, they're going to sit there. And so it's not surprising that you're finding them and that, that we're going to see them in the sediments and they're going to persist for a while. Uh, for long periods of time and 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 that's going to have you know that could have some uh, ch you know changes in sediment chemistry chem and sediment processes and you know you have organisms that you know do bioturbate in the red you know the and ingest sediment and they'll be ingesting those plastics and again right. you know you worry about the chemistry of of those kinds of particles that are going to be ingested by these organisms as they as they work their way through those sediments yeah, it is an active area of, of research, uh, but I'm not aware of any localized local studies. Most of those, I think, are in the Great Lakes. You're, you're welcome to come over here and start at Goldsmith Inlet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, the wastewater treatment that filters out the microplastics. Okay, so then then the microplastics are burned. Is that right? And then what hap And what what's the effect of that? Well, you know, in in, in Connecticut, for example, uh, you know, the biosolids, the sludge, if you will, that's collected at uh, wait at wastewater treatment plants. Uh, some of that is uh, incinerated here in Connecticut. Um, I'm not sure exactly in Long Island now what the fate of that material is. Uh, I know some of it gets transported elsewhere uh, and, and land applied. Um, you know, that material that gets incinerated, uh, that's a very, very high temperature process. And uh, you, you would hope, uh, and again, I'm not familiar with studies that are looking at this, um, but that, that would be those polymers and microplastics would be thoroughly incinerated with that sludge. Um, and, you know, what that means for air emissions and, and, you know, hydrocarbon emissions from that and how that changes, that's a good question that, that somebody will probably take up at some point in time. I figured it would be very toxic, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Mark, did you have any questions, comments? I always have comments. I know thank you, you. do. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Dr. Bressler, the, uh, you've touched on everything. And I know uh, Tara had talked about consumer responsibility, but we've got, and you mentioned ex the extended producer responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to close that entire loop mm -hmm. so that everyone is involved at every level. I know we've banned plastic bags and styrofoam peanuts at the state level, plastic bags at the county level. Uh, we've talked about, you know, microbeads at the federal level, and we just got to keep working. Every level has to be working at the same time to get all of this done. Um, and you've got the carrot and the stick. It's it's the carrots of a company coming in as a niche market, perhaps, but also leading the market like Nike, as you mentioned, right. uh, coming in and being the leader, the first mover in a product or a product line or a concept and winning out over the competition so that they follow. But at the same at the same time, you're, you're using the stick to beat back the people who aren't really helpful in yeah. the uh, in the entire scheme of things. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, uh, you know, we've got a solid waste problem on Long Island with uh, we're closing our last two landfills in the next two years. They're very well aware in the solid waste management industry, especially here on Long Island. Uh, we're working towards a zero waste 
initiative. Uh, we've been working on it for several months right now, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly continue that. Uh, I took a note on the um, the Filtrol washing machine filter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a great thing, um, and and again, you know, it's it's just endless. You, and, and, and fashion being one of those drivers, you know, mm -hmm. this this uh, synthetic. We have synthetic towels hanging yeah. off our, our you know off the front of the stove. It's right. endless. It's just it's in everything. Everything. Yeah. So as, if we're conscious, and I know uh, you know we've at, at NFEC we've worked very, very uh, conscientiously at getting people aware, first of all, and then changing their behavior and offering alternatives. So yeah. thank you for that. Well, I think, you know, and it's very important, the point you bring up about, you know, this kind of communication across all levels of the system. Uh, you know, I, I was really impressed with the, the clothing manufacturer Patagonia, because of course they have a lot of high performance active wear that's used that plastic. And, you know, and again, they're very receptive to ideas and, and looking at the problem and how they can better perform in the market uh, while at the same time reducing uh, the impacts of the product. And there needs to be more of those kinds of discussions, you know, uh, manufacturers understanding how their products behave when it gets to a material recovery facility and, and how that's all sorted out. And, and yeah, it, it may have to be incentivized uh, to get them behave in a certain way. Uh, but, you know, there might be ways of doing that where the consumer would never even know the difference in, in terms of the product that they handle. Uh, and, and so I think that, that communication across all levels of, of waste management uh, and manufacturers would, would really be useful. Don, do we have some more questions? Uh, no, not that I can see. I think that's awesome. everything. Tara's got her hand up in that. Margaret, the cruise person, she's still got her hand up. Yeah, but they, I'll bet they she already, has another question. I wouldn't wouldn't be surprised. They, I think they already had their hands up. So it's. I did, I did, but since um, I forgot to take it down. But uh, <laughs> since you mentioned um, consumers and Patagonia, um, I just listened to podcasts. Um, Patagonia has a huge, a huge. Um, um, a project where they're accepting clothes to rework them right. instead of um, throwing them out, which right. is an awesome thing. So being consumers and realizing, you know, you don't need a coat every single year that's been um, put on us by um, whatever, uh, consumer culture, let's call it, and um, to take care of our things and not buy cheap crap, you know, the fast fashion industry, you know, there's a reason that a t-shirt is, you know, a $5 t-shirt because mm -hmm. it lasts five minutes right. and then it, you can't recycle it into anything. And then it's like wasting resources, wasting the work involved. It's, uh, you know, going back onto the end of the chain of the people that are uh, producing it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and people at the top are getting rich from the labors of, um, you know, poor workers or oh, oh, exploited workers. What was the name of that podcast? I'm sorry, what? Oh, um, I have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead no, and do that, it... We could use that, sure. I just yeah, thought it would be interesting. Yeah, we've um, got to start thinking in terms of the circular economy. And I think that oh, you know, absolutely. The, the linear consumption model has been killing us for longer than we know. Yeah. So getting into the circularity of, of this and systems and, and thinking in terms of around planet and round economics uh, to mirror that I think has really yeah. got to happen. Yes. Yeah. So the um, it's there's a company, I think it, the name of the company is called Upstream or the organization, but the podcast is called the Indisposable Podcast. And it's awesome, 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 awesome. And if you look it up, I would say um, there was a recent one within the past couple of weeks um, that um, interviewed, they're having a program called the Reusies, where they're recognized, you've heard of it. So um, they're interviewing the people that are being the judges. And one of the judges is going to be Bill McDonough, who um, did uh, Cradle to Cradle. Um, and he, uh, it's his, listen to that one first, because it really lays it out. Um, and he's so, um, he's, he's such a visionary. So I recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, 
I'd like to, at this point, I'd like to thank Dawn and Debbie and, and everybody who did the uh, film for NFBC about the alternative products. Um, I don't know how old that film is, is and how long we've been working on all that, but I bought them this month. Um, so just, to, I'm, I'm just pointing out in a humorous way how long it takes for behavior change to actually happen. But um, my, my, um, my wife is extremely happy with them. So that's a, that is a, a total win in this house. There's no plastic and the cardboard boxes go into the cardboard recycling. And it's, uh, it was a huge, a huge, um, a huge indication that this can be done. It can be done. We lived without it before. <laughs> and, the, and the recycling, not recycling, the reuse economy had existed and it was very effective. And now that we have all this technology, it can be even more effective. So yep. I think it's a, a good, um, exciting time to be alive. Right. <laughs> we can make things happen. Yeah. Well, on, yeah. on that note, I would like to say thank you to everyone um, joining us this evening and a very special thank you to you, Professor Breslin. Um, you really, uh, again, enlightened us. Um, and, uh, you know, um, this side of the pond, uh, you know, we share the sound, this very vital resource. and. Um, you know, we have to take care of it. We need to be good stewards. And you helped us to understand why and how we can, things we can do to accomplish that. So thank you so very much. Thank you thank for you. inviting me. And if, if people have additional questions, you feel free to contact me. Wonderful. We thank appreciate you. that. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good, good night. night. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. North Fork Environmental Council. <laughs> oh.